And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Cave of Monsters Games, the guy who gets ye the guy who gets yelled at every time his color timer starts beeping, the one and only Sam Cusack. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well, Mildred. Thank you for having me. And given the subject matter, I had to put in one color timer joke. <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, uh, I was because it was either going to be that or getting yelled or getting yelled at about scaling 80 meter monsters. <laughs> No, the color timer, I think I think that's the joke to go with here, right? And it definitely, you know, ties into not only the title of the game, but some of the mechanics as well. So I appreciate the thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. So I usually start at the humble beginnings. And given the subject matter, it's one of those things we're going to have to visit in two angles. So first, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Sure. Um, so I, uh, I've always been interested in role-playing games, but uh, never really had a, a group to play with until I moved to Portland, Oregon, which is where I am now. Um, I come from uh, comics uh, publishing and like event coordination background, and so there's some parallels between like good comic art and games with like really good art or comic artists who would make uh, uh, games with good art. So I was always interested... Um, but games really stuck for me when I started playing uh, games with some folks who were running uh, games for the Gauntlet. Um, I think the first one I played was uh, the space offshoot of Dungeon World, uh, which name escapes me. Um, but that, like, meeting with that group on a week-to-week -week basis introduced me to a bunch of different uh, styles of games. Um, and it, I've always been interested in, like, how do you build a system to tell stories and how do you build a framework to be able to tell stories? And I thought that was comics for a while, but it's a much more involved process. And I think sometimes uh, you can get into some like not creative restrictions, but depending on the people you're working with, the publisher you're working with, sometimes the story becomes what, not what you want it to. And games, I think really, uh, became that play space for freedom for being able to tell like really weird wild stories that had uh just as powerful as an impact but like a little bit less of the sort of like publishing commitment if that makes sense um so yeah i just like i i fell in love with it and this was at a time when i was working for uh, a company that was publishing uh the power rangers comics and i was watching a lot of um super sentai during that time and that led me to more tokusatsu and that really became a space of like man i i would love to see this kind of story in uh these formats but obviously you know because of whatever restrictions be it power rangers or super sentai you don't always get the more adult content or like post-apocalyptic content or anything like that so um using games and my love of tokusatsu it felt like the right opportunity to like get out and um, make that content and make that format uh, and system for people to be able to tell their own tokusatsu stories in. And that's where Henshin came from, which is the game I think people know me the best for. Mm -hmm. uh, Henshin is Sentai RPG, which funded on Kickstarter back in 2019. Uh, we've since released a like 200 plus page book filled with a bunch of different kinds of modules with strange ideas, everything from like, what if the universal monsters were uh, uh, a Sentai squad? What if you're fighting in a world where pollution monsters have won and you're the last surviving group of humans? What if uh, food came to life and started eating humans? How would humans have to react to that? And what kind of squad and defenses would they build around that? Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of the, the long and short of it is just I was looking for uh, a way to tell really interesting stories in one format 
found another format that I think fit it a lot better and had a lot more creative freedom and interesting people doing interesting things. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like a good place to be at. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. I met some really lovely people, uh, had a lot of good success and great response to projects I put out and I'm excited to just pull more stuff out. Mm -hmm. So obviously the other angle would be, um, would be the introduction to, to, to Tokusatsu. So, Based on based on how you describe things, were, um, was your introduction of, to Tokusatsu Power Rangers, or were you familiar through um pr through earlier kaiju works? Um, so I'm 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 35 years old. I was the perfect age for when Power Rangers dropped in America. Like I was probably six or seven. Um, when it first debuted and, uh, you know, you kind of have that holy shit moment of like, what is this? It's not exactly the cartoons you've been watching. It's a lot flashier. It's a lot more interesting. So I think Power Rangers, like many people in America, that was my introduction. And I was in it for a while. And then, you know, I grew out of it uh, and then got back into it a little bit later on. And when I got back into Power Rangers a, a bit later on, that's when I got more into uh, tokusatsu from just, you know, kind of the larger approach to the genre. Uh, so, you know, your Kamen Riders, your Ultramans. Um, I love the older Gamera movies, um, the, uh, the Showa era stuff specifically. I love Godzilla as well. I'm kind of in the minority of the fan base of loving like Godzilla versus Megalon and Godzilla's revenge, kind of the hokier, weirder stuff. Um, one of the first movies my partner and I saw was uh, King Kong versus Godzilla in a theater here, which uh, is just an absolute treat if you haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I, I sort of hit the interest and in the scene at the right time where, you know, Shout Factory was really stable and was putting out all of the great releases that they put out. Uh, Criterion Collection put out that Godzilla collection, and being an adult who uh, has you know the the it income to be able to purchase those things and dive into it and the free time to do that, um, I think I just hit it at the right time. I was always interested uh, in Tokusatsu and just Japanese media in general. It was just harder to source from. A smaller town in Massachusetts until I like took the leap and moved into Boston and then Los Angeles and now now Portland. Mm -hmm. You cover you cover a weird subject matter and you're in a weird town. Yeah, exactly. We're. Uh, I'm happy to say one thing I love about living in Portland is we have one of the largest still existing video stores um, called Movie Madness. And they have a lot of really interesting tokusatsu properties. Like they have multiple copies of the Hikater, or Hikider movie. Um, they have Cyber Ninja, uh, which is also by Keita Amamiya. Hmm. Uh, just a lot of stuff that like you'd really have to dig on the internet, either through archive.org or YouTube to find. Um, and so I've also been blessed with just like, all this content and media is pretty readily available. Um, and I can just like, you know, take the opportunity to watch it and absorb. Um, and it's, you know, with the, with that scene being as old as it is, like there's so much shit that you just don't know about. Right. Mm -hmm. That either never made it to America or like, you know, uh, I, 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 in, <laughs> I have in a storefront in a cart that I'm like thinking about buying, the, a complete collection of Akamizer 3. Do you know what Akamizer 3 is? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's for those listeners who aren't as familiar, it's like three almost like villain characters, right, um, who are still like, they have pretty human proportions. Um, they're not that uh, different from, from the normal sort of hero approach. But they're just their own like squadron of heroes. But they're also like, they're not exactly like heroes. They're still villains to an extent. Um, and I found a complete series of that. Only the first eight episodes are dubbed in English, so the rest is just you know uh, sort of visual, uh, a visual delight, as it were. But the fact that 
you know, you can get some of that stuff pretty easily online through a couple of different unofficial and then sometimes official resources. Uh, it's a great time to be a tokusatsu fan and to discover and uh, feel what is, like, figure out what's right for you. Yeah. Um, I think one thing we'll probably spend some time on is, like, my interest and my taste is a bit more in that, like, Showa era, like, the, the 60s, 70s stuff where I know some people are very into, like, Ultraman Dyna and... Uh, max and more that era um and i've been getting into a bit more of that with ultraman regulus which is kind of the spiritual successor to ultraman leo which is my i think all-time favorite um uh so it's it's nice too that there's some the super eye company is now you know creating some uh, uh, entry points, I think, for older fans to be like, oh, cool, there's some new content. Like, Leo shows up in Regulus a lot, uh, but it's really Regulus's story, and he's part of the larger universe at this point. So for me, I also am getting to learn a lot more about, like, you know, uh, who Nexus is, who Reboot is, like all these other sort of new Ultra people that I'm not as familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um. Can, well, that that answers one question. I was gonna, I was gonna ask what your um, first ult, what your first ultra was. Uh, my first ultra, my first ultra, I think was Ultraman, like the titular Ultraman, and then I also got into Ultra Q pretty early, um, which is you know not technically an Ultraman series, but it's kind of it's the, the precursor. Predator. Right. It's the Japanese Twilight Zone, as it were. Um, uh, and I, I think if people haven't watched that, I'm, I'm experimenting with a game that uh, deals with some of the, the character relationships in that, because I think that's a really interesting part of the series that is kind of unexplored. But I would say I went Ultraman to Ultra Q, and then Ultraman Leo, uh, I watched, loved, uh, watched Seven, and watched Ace. Um, I have all of those here. So that's kind of the like trajectory that I've been on in terms of the, the Showa era. And then I've watched a, a couple of the movies as well. Uh, the Superior, I think it's the Superior Eight Brothers, um, or the Superior Eight Ultramen uh, that just got a re-release not that long ago, and then Ultraman Zerth also got a release, which is cool. And then there's uh, there's that Ultraman movie, which I think is just Ultraman the Next, um, which is also really fun and really wild. So that's I I think there's there's more to it. There's a lot of uh, I've been digging into like the Ultra Kids stuff a little bit because I just found a rip of that. Um, but uh, that's kind of the like the bedrock of my experience. Yeah. And of course of course the, there's been there's been there's been a whole there's been a whole lot of um ups ups downs and and right in the and right in the middles. Um <laughs> though there are there are a few since you've mentioned j just a variety of tokusats there are um there's a bit. There's a bit of a lightning round. I I'd like to play, and I I will I will name a to I will name the name of a Toku series, and sure. I'd like you to tell me that if anything comes to mind, if it's something you've seen, if it's something you are only familiar with by name. Just think it. Think of it like think of it like the nerdiest version of a Rorschach test you've ever done. Sure. Yeah. So, Garo. Uh, I, I've seen. I I am aware of it. I have not seen it. Um, it's a little too gold for me. Um, but it's something I've been is on my like to watch list. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, if you ever look at the um, design team with that one, you're gonna see a lot of familiar names. Because oh yeah, it was sta it was staffed by a lot of um, vets, including Amamiya. And and is it? Um, I don't remember the actor's name, but the guy who played Common Rider Decade isn't he a part of the cast at least in one of the iterations? Yeah, he showed he showed up in he showed up in some of the in some of the subsequent stuff. But generally gotcha. speaking, there wasn't a he was he was probably the one exception. There wasn't a whole lot of um, cr crossover actors between uh, between Common between Common Rider and um, Garo, 
Mm-hmm. Um, although, <laughs> although in although in in his in his particular case, um, he's had a interest. He's had an interesting few years. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Um. Thanks. I didn't mean to derail us with fun no, facts about Garo. So. No, wor- no worries. Um. Now you are, you already mentioned you already mentioned Hakider, which um mm-hmm. which since you mentioned movie, I'm assuming I'm going to assume you're f- referring to Mechanical Violator Hakider. Yes. Um. Done by. I'm me. also, for, for what it's worth, uh, I'm wearing a, a Kakider shirt yeah. right now uh, that I got from the Kakider store yep. before it shut down. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. Okay. I got. I gotta go with. I gotta go with the obvious. Gavon. Um. Aware of it. Haven't watched it. Um. I've had. I've had some. My friends and I have had some running jokes for the for years about treating Kenji Oba as the Japanese Chuck Norris in terms of being that kind <laughs> of a meme. You know, like that's funny. Um. Kenji Oba stepped on a landmine once. The landmine apologized. <laughs> but and the, I will admit this one's this one's going to be a bit a bit of a stretch but given the movie given the two movies it has it I will count it um Giver Uh yes um I have both the American movies on VHS um, and I've seen them both uh I like them both um yeah, I, I enjoy Giver. I think I, I've also read some of the comics. I haven't seen any of the anime, though. Mm-hmm. Um, but e- I have seen... Were the movies you were referring to the, the American releases? Yeah. yeah. Those those were the ones that were handled by the by ha- handled by the Wang brothers, who mm-hmm. would be who would be the big front runners for um for Dra- for Dragon Knight, which Unfortunately, because of some because of some licensing bullshit, Dragon Knight can't be in DVD form. Yeah. I remember. Um, I remember that Lu- that um in the pro in the process of that Lunsford had shared a torrent that had the whole that had the whole thing because of the fact that it can't that it's not possible for it to be in D- in in a DVD release. So it's a ca- it's a case of do. I'd ra- I'd rather people actually get the chance to watch it. I think was his mindset. Um, Are you? Uh, um, I'm looking right now. So uh, along the lines of Dragon Knight, um, I have and I was able to find on archive.org a full run of Mast Rider, Saban's Mast Rider, mm-hmm. which I will watch occasionally if I'm bored or I need to be angry. Um, so. So you watch uh, it when you feel when you're feeling masochistic. Got it. A little bit, or if I'm trapped on a plane and you know I have to sort well, of deal with that. Then again, um, you're then again. Um, no offense, but you're a game designer. Masochism comes with the territory. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. But, um, Zuvat. Um, that name rings a bell, but an image isn't coming. Oh, uh, yes, yes, he's the um, he's the guitar wielding hero from the seventies. Mm-hmm. Was yeah. also was also the inspiration for a Beautiful Joe. Right, right. Um, acor- according to, ac- according to what Kamiya said, I'd I'd ask him, but he's ha- but he has me blocked. <laughs> <laughs> to um. Let's see. I think there was there was one uh, there was one uh, there was one other aside aside from the aside from those. Uh, I mean, not, since you mentioned Godzilla versus Megalon, I'd I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't make any jokes about Jet Jaguar. Uh. Because. I've joked for the longest time that I could have, I would have sworn um, for the, until I until I got confirmation years later when I, when I saw that thing as a kid, I was like, was this a backdoor pilot? <laughs> One can only hope. Well, there was a gods, there was a, there was a um, 
TV series that used a lot of the Toho monsters shortly after that movie, so it pop. I think it was Island of Monsters or something like that. It's possible that it kind of was a backdoor pilot. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it was fun to see him in Singular Point or a version of Jet Jaguar in Singular Point, and like I thought the redesign was pretty nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's. I I just love when Godzilla gets really kind of crazy and. That there's especially in that movie there's this really funny concept that shows up in those kaiju movies uh, and this happens in Inframan as well if you've seen that the Shaw Brothers um, sort of take on Tokusatsu uh, where there's this idea of like public knowledge about these creatures or about Godzilla like the kid I forget the kid's name in Godzilla vs. Megalon but he at one point like says to his uh, uh, undefined relationship guardian, he's like, "We should just like, you know, send Jet Jaguar to Monster Island and like ask Godzilla to help us." And it it kind of sets up this idea that like anybody can do that if they can get to Godzilla. Like he's kind of just publicly available, <laughs> um, which I think is hilarious. Uh, that uh, people know where Monster Island is, and they're like, "Yeah, we can just like talk to Godzilla and he'll help us out." Um, that also happens in Inframan, where a guy goes through a transformation and becomes this, like, he's called the Chinese Superman, um, and becomes this, like, robotic warrior, and the entire rest of the cast is like, oh yeah, Inframan can do this, and it's like, how do you fucking know that? Um, <laughs> how, where, where did that knowledge come from? I, that's one of my favorite things about Tokusatsu, and that happens in Ultraman, too, in Ultraman Leo, when Astra, his brother, shows up, one side character is like, oh yeah, that's Leo's brother, Astra, and it's like, how, how would you know that? Like, we're just being introduced to this character. Um, but I love it, that, like, the leaps these uh, shows take for kid knowledge, right? You're watching it as an adult, and I think that's part of the miss there. Uh, obviously it's intended for children, and it's always good to be reminded of that. But it's still just, like, a, char a very charming piece of these shows. Mm -hmm. Um... Daimajin. Uh, yes, I, I've seen all three of those movies. Um, I like those. Uh, definitely kind of like the period piece of Tokusatsu. Yep. Um, any of the metal heroes? Um, I have not really messed oh. with a ton of the metal heroes. The one thing I can say that I have watched because it's shown up on uh, a blog that I frequent called Bleeding Skull, um, which is about, it's just about, like, very gonzo cinema, is the G-Bond movie, the, like, explosion at the Monster Factory uh, G-Bond movie, mm -hmm. which is a, a true delight. It's only, a movie is generous considering it's only, like, maybe 30 minutes long, um, but I think he falls into the Metal Heroes category. Yeah, although although um, I will note that one of them, Metalder, is a little bit too close, a little bit too close to the mark when it as far as um, it's like tell tell me your tell me your channeling kick tell me your channeling Kikider without telling me. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. They're like, what if it's Kikider, but you take a lot of the color away? Um, yeah, because if you don't recall, you <laughs> and. Dang it! I'll have to send. I'll have to send it through the. Because he ends up looking like that, and I'm like, <laughs> you totally were not taking notes. <laughs> it's funny. I never really got into like VR troopers or anything, though. Of that, like yeah, well, uh, Gavon and yeah, the no. series that would become, that would be adapted into both V, that would be used for both VR troopers and later on Beetleborgs. All of those were in the Metal Heroes um, series. Right, right. B-Fighter and B-Fighter Kabuto. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the a lot of the folks in... And and oh, you had Juko, B-Fighter, and then later on B-Fighter Kabuto. And the latter is, is known for... is Has the reputation of showcasing a young Ruben Langdon. Right, Mac Windy. 
because it seem it seems that just about everybody who was in who was in one form or another invo involved in what would become Devil May Cry has some kind of Toku background. <laughs> the, the writers were the writers were former Tokusatsu writers. Um, you ha you obviously have the the whole thing with Ruben Langdon, and of course, Nero is is voiced by Johnny Young Bosch. <laughs> <laughs> And, the cream um, of the crop of Black Rangers. Yeah, and um, Vir and Virgil is vo is voiced by the by the former Quantum Ranger. So, hmm, interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, de yeah, Southworth. <laughs> it it so it's it's kind it's kind of funny how it how it all goes full circle like that. Um, but there are a f there are a few there are a couple things that are Toku adjacent, but. Aren't re aren't really live action that I did want to ask if about familiar with familiarity with sure. um one of the, one of the the big one of course is um the is the two works that Ishinomori had do had done that laid the groundwork that being Cyborg zero zero nine and the Skull Man. So I have the original. Uh, Tokyo Pop run of the Cyborg 009 manga. Um, I also have the whatever that weird adaptation that came out of Arkea, uh, which is a, a um, comics outfit owned by Boom Studios um, that came out maybe like, I don't know, eight or nine years ago at this point. Uh, so I am familiar with Cyborg 009. I haven't really kept up with any of like the newer movies or adaptations, but I, I, I love that concept, love that world. Um, I've seen some of the Skullman stuff. I've never really made a concentrated effort to collect it, um, but I am aware of it. Yeah. Um, Ryu Kendo. Um, I've seen that name around, but I can't say that I know it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was gonna bring. I was. I was tempted to bring up Spectre, but that was a that was a one off movie in two thousand five that. Was was more for a to was more for a Toku festival, so it's not mm. it didn't exactly have a wide release even in Japan. It's an in mm. it is an interesting beast and it it and it has been it has been fan subbed, but <laughs> it's it is it is one of the is one of those things. Um, and last but certainly not least, I'm get. I'm guessing you have seen Supaidaman. Yes. Which is aside from the fact that that's that that is a perfect middle ground between Sentai and Super Sentai, Supaidaman is just weird. Yeah. <laughs> Even by Japan it's, it's, standards. Well, not only that, it's it's just this like beautiful I so the thing about me and my relationship with Tokusatsu is like I love the shows uh, quite a bit, but I love like learning about weird production history and like how things came to be as a result of that. And like you know, Supai Demand, I'm sure as you know, is like a, a direct result of Marvel working uh, with with Japan and just trading licenses for Godzilla for Spider-Man um, and so that's a wonderful wonderful thing uh, but yeah it is just like it's weird and that's wonderful. also how we got um, Battle Fever J yes um, Miss America yeah supposed, supposedly it was supposed the story as I always understood it was that it was supposed to be a full on it was supposed to be a full on um, co- co-created collab with Marvel but the deal fell through at some point and Battle Fever J was their way of um, improvising afterwards mm. the and uh, apparently the whole work the whole working with uh, working with Japan in that in that whole thing that was something that Stan Lee had pushed for right. and really pushed for um uh, which is un is underst understandable because he because well he was riding high on the fact that his Spider-Man project, which was was supposed to was supposed to be be um ha be hung out to dr 
hung out to die, um, ended up not. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I mean, who can fault the man for loving money and finding other ways to make more of it? Well, um, from 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 where I sit, I'd pro- I probably en- I probably enjoy rubbing it in that the thing that that everybody else thought wouldn't work ended up wor- ended up working, and I would rub that in everyone's face from here to Timbuktu. <laughs> um, can I quickly before we we move on? Can I quickly drop another sort of funny? thing that I have seen that I feel like doesn't really... I know it doesn't get talked about a lot for probably good reason, but um, I am probably one of those people who really enjoys uh, Tattooed Teenage Alien Fighters from Beverly Hills, um, which was a show that is a direct result of uh, a big split uh, at Deke, um, like a a coup d'etat of the heads of production at Deke and Haim Saban, like selling international rights from one person to the other when he shouldn't have been. Um, and the head of production at Deke creating his own uh, Super Sentai, I'm using air quotes as I'm talking here, uh, show where he couldn't find Japanese footage to use, so he just had to make everything whole cloth. That was supposed to be a competitor to Power Rangers. That's just like an absolute nightmare. Like if you are a fan of these shows and you want something that is just kind of a complete... Uh, uh, misrepresentation in a weird way, but a show that also introduces some really like fun ideas and some more mature ideas that you don't see often in Power Rangers, at least not until uh, a little later. Um, that show is, I would say, is like a really good oddball. <laughs> have Have you ever heard Have you ever heard the urban legend of the sh- of the um, chef and the Big Mac? No. Now I'm not gonna claim. I'm. I don't know where this start. I don't know where this particular urban legend started, but this is. But it's been around for quite a few years, of a chef who arrogantly thought that he could recreate a Big Mac after eating one, uh. or, after, or recre- <laughs> recreate recreate it just just by taste. Uh-huh. And it turns it turns out he couldn't do it. And the and what he ended up getting was ju- was just a really bad burger. Now some people say, well, of course it was a bad burger. It was a big Ma- Big Mac. But the point is, is that um, trying to is that trying to do what so- what someone else is doing is not as cut and dry as people think. And right. that's how that's how I view um, tattooed teen- teenage alien fighters. There is there is one American Togusats that. Was done was done in the same it was done in the same era that I think has a little bit more of an identity that also has got has also kind of um, fallen by fallen by the wayside in people's eyes, and that is um, Tierna Nog. Mm, right, right, the knights one, the Mystic Knights. Yeah, in fact, when Mystic Force came around, I was making joke I was making jokes saying that we found we found lost footage of Tierna Nog. <laughs> but that would have been really funny if they tied that in together. Actually, <laughs> I don't. Th- um, given that this, given that that was smack dab in the Disney era, I don't think that they would be able to do it. Plus, it would involve competence from Disney in order to do that. And um, right. like, even even well, even back then they were, mi- even back then they were mismanaging. I still I still find it ridiculous that they got on. Um, Jason David Frank for swearing. Mm. They thought his key. They thought his key eyes were swearing. <laughs> to this, do not ask me how they came to that conclusion. Even after all these years, I still have no idea. Yeah. Oh, wild. It the mouse. Yeah, it's just another day in the house of the rat. <laughs> See, mo- most people when they come into the show, they think they're going to have a, ni- a nice, a nice, quiet little interview with some afternoon tea or something. Like- That's not what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get quizzed about your uh, very specific subject matter, um, but I feel good about my performance. Um... <laughs> well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, qu- I wouldn't say quizzed, but if you're, whenever you're building. It takes a special kind of mind to want to want to build 
a or want to build a want to build an RPG in general and around a specific topic. So nobody nobody who's doing that is going to be a casual fan of something. Right. Absolutely. And that's that's the that's the way I see it, and I just, I just like to give people the opportunity to talk to talk everyone's ear off about about it while doing my own little little brand of shit posting in the process. <laughs> because we are not professionals here in the temple. We are assholes. Assholes with a purpose, because we're on a mission from God, but still assholes. <laughs> so one of the one of the other things that really struck my attention when it came to three minutes is you are even if it's even if it's adapted from from a pre- from a previous um, from a pre- from a previous game, you're using a card based approach, and even nowadays, RPGs that have the gall to use cards are still quite the rarity. Right. So I'm curious what what drew you to that particular approach. Yeah. So so for those of you, if this is your first introduction to three minutes, um, three minutes utilizes um, a system that was popularized by uh, uh, Dinoberry Press in their game Gun and Slinger, um, and I'm using it under their marked and made license. I just want to be upfront about that um, because you know adaptation, especially when you're like not reading the fine print. Um, it can very easily sort of be seen uh, uh, in a negative light. Um, you know, the cards... I was drawn to to the card system, I think, because of how... how much chance there is as a part of the gameplay. You know, you are... So the system operates where everyone... If you're all, uh, if you're playing with, uh, say, three people, you're going to have uh, a central deck made up of, um, I think it's two decks, right? Uh, so, no, I'm just reading my math uh, correctly. Um, so, if you're playing uh, with three players and one narrator, um, you are going to have, um, that's four people, so you're going to have a a uh, total of five uh, decks all shuffled and stacked together in a central pile. Um, players will take two cards at the beginning of their turn and they'll make pairs in their hand or they'll use, uh, so they'll use pairs and face cards to make turns um, or to take action, right? Um, and essentially say what they want to do to the narrator. If the narrator presents a challenge to them, a certain rating based on the uh, perceived level of difficulty. Um, and then that person will use the pair or their face cards um, to make a attempt at succeeding. Any successes will go into a pile called the Guardian pile, and any failures will go into a uh, pile called the AG pile. Um, AG is the name for our monsters uh, in the universe of the game. It's also a nod to AG Superaya. Um, and the guardian pile allows you to summon your guardian, which is the term that we use for the giant alien or Ultraman, so to speak. Um, and I really liked, uh, I loved the mechanic of using pairs because go fish means that, uh, you know, you're kind of hunting and pecking for cards. You're making deliberate decisions to hold on to certain cards, maybe for bigger actions later on. There's an element of strategization that I think is lost when you're just using dice, right? Because dice are so so random. You have uh, your stats that you're often rolling against, but it's not necessarily... There's not as much strategy uh, uh, indicated in it. Um, I also, in this game, with the, the Guardian pile, at least, when you summon your Guardian, you shuffle that deck that pile of cards and you draw three cards and use those for combat so in a way there's also still a randomness in guardian combat where it's not just a like you know a huge hit that you're going to to roll out that is a guaranteed success there's still a level of uncertainty to that i'm in a level of am i going to be able to defeat this ag am i going to take any combat on as a result um, in the game to any damage that you do against the AG could also do damage not only to yourself but to the city. 
Um, there's uh, damage rules later in the game based on the uh, suit that you get uh, or the suit that you use in the cards. Um, so I, I was really just drawn to cards because there's so much variety and strategy that you can do picking apart the different elements. It also really heavily influenced just some of the flavor of the game. Um, when you're creating uh, the character roles are you create a host who is your human person, they're joining a patrol to fight against AG, they're bonded with a guardian. Um, when you're building your guardian, there's a table where you can draw cards um, and just using the numerical value, determine what their attitude, uh, their head adornment, their eyes, and their abdominal pattern looks like. And, you know, my other games didn't have as much. The character creation is a lot more open-ended, and I wanted to try creating something that, while you can still say, you know, fuck it, I can do, I want to do whatever I want, like, it, that's uh, completely within your reason to do. I wanted to provide some resources for uh, just creating something random that is completely sort of outside of your control and playing with what you get. Uh, I that That sentiment is something that is really striking that balance of like player agency while still having a little bit of restriction is like really interesting to me as a designer and that's that drove a lot of three minutes uh the design choices behind three minutes Mm -hmm. and with that now with that in mind is it a is is it a case where only where um Pairs and face cards are the things that are going to matter. Um, it's not going to go any larger into like sets. Yeah, that for simplicity and just like keeping players focused on, uh, you know, really collecting like two different types of things. I I am going to keep it just as pairs and face cards now. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, like I I'll say it here on the podcast, and this is happening with some of my other games, like. This is, you know, the first version of three minutes, obviously based on playtest feedback, um, but there's always a chance that I could go back and make some changes and expand it in the future. But right now, it's really just focused on those pairs and face cards. I think that's a system that, that works pretty well and has been pretty well tested. Um, and it, it just keeps people focused on moving the action quickly rather than trying to, like, uh, you know, kind of, uh, min max the best hit, right? Yeah, I also I also find it interesting in the in the material you sent me where aces are treated as um, face cards, right? Because usually when people think of face cards, they're thinking of ja- of kings, queens, and jacks, right? And king, queens, and jacks are included in there as well. So there's there's technically four face cards. Um, and that that is a bit of a carryover from the original system, uh, where they uh, Gun and Slinger included that those as face cards as well. Um, so I really just wanted to you know not rock the boat too much there. Mm-hmm. And I will I will admit as well that the the concept of taking a blind shot for. This might be a bit of a deep cut, but it rem- but the system that I was remi- I was reminded of the drawing approach that's used in um, the Saga system. If you're familiar uh, with that, one, if you're familiar, with I'm that, not actually I'm not actually familiar with that. Um, the Saga I'd system love to hear a bit was more. a was was a card based um, system that was used, but that was made created by TSR in the mid '90s and was used for two games. Um, the Marvel Adventure game mm-hmm. and Dragonlance Fifth Age. Mm. Um, the main difference between the two is, um, it was it was a series. It was a it wasn't technically a standard playing card deck. It was what was known as the Fate deck, and your hand what your hand was either was both your health and your level. Um. And norm- normally you'd normally you'd play you'd play cards from from your hand if you if um if the action you were attempting matched the suit then that car- then the card that you would play would, is considered trump 
and you could draw the top card from the Fate deck and add that to it. And of course, this this is basically an exploding die if, and without without actually having dice. So, if the next card is considered Trump, then that one get then that one gets added, and you can keep going. Or you or you can just do a dr you can just do a draw, but um, no take backs. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what I that latter rule is what came to mind when I saw the blind shot because yeah. you are drawing a, on the one hand maybe it'll maybe it'll do well for you on the other hand maybe you might get screwed over right yeah sort of taking that that risk of drawing from the main deck not knowing what you're gonna get uh, could be really advantageous for you you could draw a face card um, or you could draw you know a ten or something like that that will more than likely guarantee you success um, and add something pretty nice to the guardian pile yeah just uh, just out of curiosity um, are do you have do you have it where the Joker has to be taken out before play, or do you have a rule in mind for the Joker? Is it, or is it just another face card? Uh, I believe the Joker is taken out before play. Um, yep. So in uh, in the game preparations, um, all Jokers are removed from the decks, and the decks are shuffled into one. Which cer which certainly makes sense. Yeah. Now, a crucial a crucial thing with the with a lot of um, sh with a lot of TV shows in the Ultra series and to a, to a lesser extent the movies is that is that there is usually some sort of scientific investigation group with it with that is handling the investigation of the mo of the monsters. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it it goes under different names. Sometimes it is the SSSP. Sometimes it's storage. Sometimes it's guts. But there's always some uh, um, organization that is handling that. Um, is that how how would you um, have that ha how that have that handled or carried over into three minutes? So in three minutes, the conceit of three minutes is that every player is a member of a patrol. Um, and in the book, there's a patrol creation section uh, with another table uh, where you, um, as a group, uh, starting with the oldest player, randomly draw a card um, from the central deck and use a table to determine what your name is. Um, so you have things like uh, uh, words like league or group. Um, you have different types of nature or landscapes, uh, like a swamp or a forest or a mountain. Uh, other descriptive terms uh, like radioactive, uh, laser, sunbeam, uh, lantern, and then um, some more like action-y words, uh, ballistic, trajectory, aerodynamic. I wanted to leave that um, kind of up to chance as well, where everybody's part of the group, you're all on the same level playing field. Um, and, you know, maybe it is, depending on the type of GM you have, maybe you keep the secret that you all are imbued uh, with Guardians or you've met uh, these aliens, or maybe you were deliberately chosen because uh, you all are bonded, and so this uh, patrol wants to utilize that uh, as effectively as possible. But that's kind of the, like, the connective tissue between the players, right? That's your, like, you're meeting in a tavern to go uh rescue this princess or steal treasure um but uh nobody is nobody is necessarily a civilian right away um or for a long period of time maybe in the first couple of sessions you have that how do you join the group and why um but everyone moving forward from that becomes a part of the team mm -hmm. so with that, with that in mind, since since AGs are go are going to be a major factor, I'm guessing for the GM you do have a um, both a means to cre both a means to do AG creation as well as a way to randomize it. Yes, uh, so there's an AG creation guide, um, and that gives you a sense of you know. What is the AG looking for, or what do they want? Because oftentimes, at least in uh, some of the uh, older uh, Ultra series, a lot of the AG are driven by 
I would argue, pretty animalistic needs, right? They're hungry. They're after a certain uh, type of energy resource. I think about uh, I think about Antler a lot. I think from like episode five of Ultraman, the beetle monster. Um, uh, so the AG is after something in particular. Um, that thing is located at a site that you need to go to, and so the AG is seen around that site. Um, for example, in the book, there is a uh, <laughs> example AG um, uh, called Ignacula, uh, who is a literal heat vampire, um, and he is uh, in. You find him in a uh, snowy mountain area, um, trying to steal all of the heat that humans are creating to keep themselves warm. Um, so there are some example AG included uh, in the book. Um, and a guide to create them. Uh, I am also hoping, there is also an AG creation table uh, following that um, uh, example page. And we are, you know, we're currently crowdfunding this book right now to expand and add a little bit of material to it. And one thing that I'm hoping to do is there's an opportunity for folks, if they uh, want to get in on it, um, for them to create an example AG that will be illustrated and added to the book uh, by the illustrator uh, of the book. Um, so if people are interested, if they've had a monster's design they've always been kicking around, that they want to see actualized, uh, this is a great opportunity for people to, to jump in on that. Yep. Now, with that in, with that in mind, uh, I do I do appreciate I do. Um, appreciate that you do have um, a mo you do have a move set when it comes to guardian combat that is that that fit that is definitely in is definitely in keeping with the source material. Um, mm -hmm. But since but given that source material, I do I feel I do have to ask this. Sure. What is gonna, what is going to be the equivalent of of the good old Spacian beam? The space and beam. So, if you take a look at combat, um, that is equated by essentially you getting um, sorry a sequence of the same uh, card. Or uh, I'm just taking a look uh, at this. So, um, when you draw cards, you'll draw from that uh, guardian pile. Um, if you get a pair uh, in there, your guardian will pull off a special move, and that can be shooting out that beam of light. Or, you know, I always love when Ace does those kind of like bladed weapons uh, that get shot out. Um, so, if a pair is uh, in there, that damage is considered double. Um, so, say I think the example that's included in the book is if uh, there's a pair of six, because uh, if those cards trump the uh, AG or the opponent's cards, um, that damage is counted uh, cumulatively. Um, so if you had a pair of six, that would normally be counted as 12, but that would be doubled to 24 points of damage. Um, and then if you get three of a kind, you automatically win that round of combat. So I think about scenes where, like, you know, kaiju or w whatever the monster, the alien name is, um, where they get their uh, arms cut off or they get cut in half or there's a lot of cutting right in the ultra series um if you get three of a kind uh when you draw your three cards you automatically win, win that round of combat so you know going back to like why the card mechanics are so interesting is that like there is the opportunity for that to happen and depending on the size of the guardian pile um you know there's there's a higher chance of that happening than there is coming from the central deck and if players uh, communicate and work together, there's always the opportunity for them to kind of like stack the deck in their favor by putting certain types of cards together. So there could be a higher chance of getting uh, pairs or three of a kind. But that's that's how I incorporated that into the game. So I really wanted it to... I don't love it in media when that kind of just happens automatically all the time, you know? I, I want that kind of action and that special... Uh, special effects budget to really matter um and that felt like the best way to incorporate that in yeah. now i'm not i'm not ex with the next question i have i'm not expecting this to be to, to be right it to be in there immediately but but i'm curious if this is something you thought about there have i'd s 
since since T I won't say Tiga was the first was the first to do this, but there have been ultras that have had some degree of form switching. Um, mm. The early I I think there were I think there were one or two that did it before Tiga, but when I think but Tiga was the is the first one that comes to mind with that. Um, no, usually usually with the motif of having one all rounder, one um, one one po one power type that does a lot of that focuses on wrestling moves, and one that I guess you would call us I guess you would call some degree of psychic. It's usually some sort of um, flying type with weird abilities. <laughs> sure. But. Is that is that con is that concept of form switching something you've thought you've thought about for the future? I haven't explored it too much yet. Um, you know, as I indicated, this game is really heavily influenced by the Showa era, which you don't see too much of that. Um, if anything, characters often get like different kinds of weapons or like you know different kinds of power ups. I'm thinking of like Leo getting the brace that he gets from Ultraman King. Um, so no, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. That may be interesting to explore, you know, the, the, like, differentiation that I have between Guardians in the game is made up of a couple of things, right? It's made up of, um, characters have an elemental, uh, base, so to speak, or some characters are made up of, like, air and water and earth, that is really a lot of flavor and to give them a little bit more uh, of a visual and unique identity. Um, and then each character, there are six guardian types that are included in the book, which impact the host's stats um, and, you know, give some sort of an overall stat block. So there are some, the three stats being build, which is your physical, uh, brains, your mental, and charm, your social. So there are some characters like the, or guardians, like the guardian made up of the wind has a negative one in build, a zero in brains, and a plus one in charm. Um, so that can, you know, augment you in a particular way, uh, as opposed to um, the, the guardian made up of sound has a plus one in build and a minus one in charm. Um, I, I'd be open to figuring out a way, I think, to come up with some, like, guardian type switching, or maybe guardian type merging, if people wanted to uh, get into that in terms of player advancement. But right now, it's very much like your guardian is your guardian. As you advance, um, you are able to add points to one of your stats, so you can augment some of those negatives um, moving forward and become a bit more of a balanced out character, or dump all of your stats into into one if you find that one is suiting you uh, in a better way than others. Um, but right now, no, everybody is like uh, uh, not locked into their particular form, but they have a, a standard form that they're able to build upon rather than switching in and out. I will say, though, um, to call out another game, uh, a, a game designer named Rudo Judo just put out a game called uh, Giant of Light, um, and form switching is included in that game, and that is another like Ultraman-inspired game that I think draws a bit more from the Tiga, the Dyna era, that era where you see some more of those, those forms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. I see it. I, I see. It didn't take long for me to look, for me to um, find it. Um, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's something I might that's something I might research another day. It's whenever it co whenever it comes to RPGs built around a concept, one thing that I always try and see is how far that concept can be stretched. Um, sure. Though. As far as far as going with the elemental approach, was that just you taking the giant of light concept that we've that's our that's always been in the Ultra series and and just expanding on what you can have folks made of? Yeah, more or less. I wanted to have have a have a little bit of flavor uh, there um, and just have those have those characters uh, feel a bit different from each other. Um, and, you know, I hope, I, I love elemental stuff, you know, talking about, like, Tirna Nog, um, and some of those other, uh, tokusatsu types of media, 
where characters embody particular elements. I think Mystic Force was mentioned in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, They do a bit of that there. I love when uh, elemental distinctions drive character choices and action from a storytelling perspective, and I think that's more where that design decision comes from, of if you have a guardian uh, made up of, of sound who has a very dismissive nature, like, what is your relationship to that guardian? Um, one thing that is included in this in this book is a bit of you, the host and the guardian, being two distinctive characters and having a relationship. Um, when guardians take enough damage after a while, they'll need to be... Or when hosts and guardians take enough damage, there will need to be a period of heal- healing where they go away and you're encouraged to write a, a small poem uh, that period is called downtime so when you take downtime you and your guardian can rest and recoup reflect on what's happened up into that point so you you go away for a turn you come back restored but you need to you know tell the story of where were you um were you transported anywhere did you stay on earth did you go train that happens a lot in ultraman leo right where he goes and trains to get better and and rest um and there's a lot about you know how what is your life like being bonded with this alien how does it impact you but also like what is the relationship between the two of you and how do you work together to to make things happen Mm -hmm. and when it hold on (laughs) sorry something something went down the wrong pipe <clears throat> okay. Now, with that, with that in mind, um, I know I played a bit of word association earlier, but given the uh, given the whole um, element thing, I uh-huh. would like I would like to I would like to play a bit of a bit of word association as far as what um what 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 kind of char- what kind of character in that in that series would. Ca- would come to mind for each of these um, elements, aside from light, because that's a little obvious. But what would are there any um, characters in the Ultra series that come that come to mind when it comes to a mm. guardian made of the wind? I feel like, and again, like forgive me because I'm going to lean into sort of the space that I know pretty well. I think about Seven a lot. Um, I think Seven's got a really, obviously, unique design that's pretty different from Ultraman and, and Jack, who preceded him. Um, but I, I like his Mayan design makes his flight make more sense to me, if that makes sense. At least, like, the slugger, I think, feels a little bit more aerodynamic. Um, I also feel like... I felt like when I was watching Seven, I was surprised by how much of the action was him being person-sized. You know, where I feel like in the original and and, uh, Ultraman Leo, it's almost always giant. You never really... You don't... It's very rare to see them um, smaller than that form. And in Seven, I feel like uh, Seven shows up a lot in buildings being like, I'm, you know, I'm red and <laughs> I got all this silver armor on me, look out. Um, and I think there's something funny and, you know, elemental about, like, air is all around us. It's funny where it can get into and where it can't get into. Um, so I, I would say seven's a good pull for that. Mm-hmm. Um, waters. Water. Um... I'm going to go... I think I'm going to go with Astra from Ultraman Leo. Um, And that's kind of a, like, thinking about water as a... Water as a force in the way that it's referenced in Kung Fu um, and sometimes in other media where, you know, it's a very gentle, uh, life-giving force, but it's also this really, like dangerous and powerful thing um if you have too much of it if there's you know if the weather gets pretty crazy um and it it leaves its mark on things um Mm -hmm. i really love 
Astra, and I love that one of the Ultramen, although they are... I have my frustrations with them not always showing up with the other uh, six Ultramen after Taro, uh, but the fact that he, like, he makes a big impact in the story, but he, like, he really comes and goes in a lot of ways. I think it's funny when he shows up and uh, Ultraman Leo's like, great, my brother's here, we can hang out, and Ultra or uh, Astra's like, all right, I gotta leave. Um, he's he's impactful when he's there, but it's always funny to see him go. Um, and I think he, for water, he, he kind of strikes me. Mm-hmm. Um, Earth. Hmm. I'm trying to not be obvious because there's, I forget the name, but there's that Ultraman who's uh, quite buff. Uh, which is always funny to see uh, see characters like that. Who's a little bit later? He was in the um, the recent YouTube series uh, with the um, shit. Sorry, it's getting my mind is starting to slow down a little bit. Oh, with the Absolutians. Um, uh, I want to say I feel like the original Ultraman makes sense to me for earth um he's dependable uh there's not much to him he's kind of simple in the best way where he's what you see is what you get um but obviously like you know i think just uh yeah i i feel like when i think of earth i I do think of simplicity i think of a little bit of i don't want to say blandness but i want to say just like i i feel comfortable with it, um, and I want to just like be around it and feel safe within it, and that is definitely a uh, a character I think you can feel safe in. Mm-hmm. Oh, and flames. I will I will note with flames the the obvious one that that I could bring up is Glen Fire. Mm, I'm not as familiar uh, with that. I mean, flames to me, it's always like, it's anger, right? It's it's being able to control your anger and your emotions, um, and so I just I go with Ultraman Leo there. That's like an easy one. Mm-hmm. Like, I went with Glenn Fire. Show um, first showed up in the Ultraman Zero movies, mm. and the reason why I said it obvious is well because he looks like this. <laughs> okay. Yep, I see him. He's it is very obvious. <laughs> very obviously fire. I mean it's hard not to be obviously fire, I think, with all the red coloring here. Um right, there's obviously an, an element of heat. Uh they're kind of just big Christmas ornaments that are flying around to an extent. It um, doesn't it doesn't exactly help that he's voiced by <laughs> Tomokazu Seki. Mm. <laughs> who has, has a reputation for playing hotheads, if you'll pardon the pun. I, I certainly will. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I try really, really hard to not, to not make any hothead jokes with him, but when you have a design like that, can you really blame me for going to that? No, not at all. Like, not at all. It, it's a case of they knew exactly what they were doing. But... Um, oh, sound. I suppose that that uh, would be a tricky one. I, you know, if we're skipping light, if we're skipping over light, like I think of sound. I think because you know there is not a a. I think as murky visual element as you get with some of these others, um, and I I mean murky, not really in a dirty way, uh, but I always think about. Ultraman Ace having a really clean design, um, and I, I just think there's like a cleanliness and a sleekness to him. Again, you get a lot of like aerodynamic uh, feelings with the blade, uh, but with it having kind of like a larger uh, hole within it, um, I think there's something very sound-like for, for him. Mm-hmm. And I, I could I could, cer- I could certainly see it. Oh. 
Especially give especially given all of his beam spam. <laughs> beam spam, I think to um you know, the at least the two rings coming together for a part of the transformation has a bit of sound to it, as opposed to like the Leo ring or uh, the Ultra Eye. Um, it's not as uh, clangy, I guess. Mm-hmm. There have there have been characters over the years who have been ultra likes, but on the villainous end of thing, obviously the the big example that got used quite quite a bit until he overstayed his welcome was. Um, Belial, right. but beyond but beyond that, there is the villain and and sometimes not qu- some and sometimes anti-hero, um, Juggalus, who no who f- always seems to find a way to come back even when you think he's dead. Remember, <laughs> remember, folks, check the body. <laughs> but. With the system that you have for AG, would it be um, relatively easy to to make an equivalent to those kind of things? Whether it be some sort of fallen um, guardian or some or something close? Yeah, absolutely. You know, AG for the most part um, follow the same design uh, as the guardians, so there's nothing really uh, there's nothing really that would prevent you from doing that. Um, I just think. Knowing, like, knowing that a lot of people are probably going to bring this to a table for a one-shot or, like, a limited series of campaigns, I more design this around the idea of having interesting-looking monsters, um, especially if people want to take the opportunity to draw stuff out. I think that's one thing that's fun and unique being in the tokusatsu space is we have a lot of fan-generated art of created teams. Um, And like some of my other games, this will probably start to get modules created for it. And so there will be, uh, you know, distinctively different art than what is in the book. Um, So that's, you absolutely could. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. Um, But I just wanted to, you know, sort of justify why the book is written with with monsters in mind as opposed to uh, evil guardians. Mm -hmm. So with with that in mind... Um, what would you be shoot? What would be you be shooting for as far as a page count for the book? Um, so the book is probably going to come in between, I would say, sixty-five to eighty pages, uh, depending on uh, what kind of content that we get. Um, you know, the book is fully written, but I am as you said, a bit of a masochistic game designer, uh, or a masochist just being a game designer, there may be one or two things I will add uh, as a result of the Kickstarter based on feedback that I get. I also just released today a a quick start to the game, um, so that gives you a a lot of what we've been talking about, at least in terms of host and uh, guardian creation, um, and then a look into combat and damage and how that's all allocated. Um, I, I'm curious what people think about it, if they feel like there's anything that's crucially missing. Um, I would be happy to add things before the official release if uh, the community feels like it's absolutely necessary. But right now I'm feeling pretty confident about where the content stands and how it will, how it will work. Yep. Uh, and I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing it. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. (laughs) Sounds good. Well, Mildred, thank you for having me. I had a lovely time. Mm -hmm. Um, It's always nice to take time to talk uh, tokusatsu, especially... Uh, this Ultraman uh, zone and uh, get get into some more specifics and deep pockets of the, the fandom. So uh, thank you for helping to highlight and bring the word out about the game. Um, it's fun to feed uh, more original content into the tokusatsu community, and I hope that people will take this as another opportunity to tell their own really interesting stories, because I think that is an area uh, that's just like really ripe with fun possibility 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the particular brand of crazy we have here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>